Imagine for a moment living in 16th century Europe. Continuous wars, famines and the Black Death had so traumatized the ordinary person that they scarcely had the courage to venture out of their own village. Superstition and fear were rife and the church was itself being rent apart by scandals and Protestant revolution. Ottoman invaders were seemingly unbeatable as they pressed into the Balkans and Eastern Europe and completely dominated the Mediterranean. Christian princes, when not fighting amongst themselves, were desperately trying to contain the threat of Islam and yet they nevertheless continued to trade with them for exotic oriental goods and spices, paying exorbitant fees for the privilege. Some began to wonder if it was possible to bypass the Levant and go around the long way, straight to the source, and thus cut out the profiteering middleman. Stolen and smuggled Arabic maps suggested it was possible. The idea began to gain traction, and a number of intrepid seamen from the Kingdom of Portugal took the challenge of venturing out into the Atlantic Ocean and probing their way down the great unknown coast of Africa, eventually breaking through into the Indian Ocean, with Asia now lying wide open for direct trade. Others proposed going west and found America just waiting there to be exploited. September 2022 marks the 500th anniversary of one such voyage of exploration, conceived by Portuguese dreamer Ferdinand Magellan, who had the unshakable belief that he could get to India via an as yet undiscovered southwest passage that would afford an easy shortcut to Asia. On his journey, he would be both right and wrong many times, and ultimately take one gamble too many. But on the way, they would discover new lands, bizarre wildlife and strange people, in an expedition that for the first time in history saw mankind circumnavigate the entire globe. Join us as we dive into the Magellan Elcano expedition of 1519 and get a sense of the history, drama and wonder of a world that was rapidly shrinking and after which trade would never be the same again. But before we begin, please take a moment to like and subscribe for updates. And if you enjoy our content, please show your support by making a small, easy donation through the heart-shaped thanks link next to the like and share buttons below, or via the PayPal link in the description section. Better still, why not get better access and personal involvement by becoming a Patreon supporter? Your generous help will help keep this unfunded educational channel going. An audio-only version of this and all our other videos is available on the Heroes and Legends Documentary Channel podcast, available through Spotify, iTunes and other leading broadcasters in case you want to listen in your car or perhaps cure your insomnia. Don't forget to share with your friends and be sure to check out the excerpts, merch and resources on our Facebook and web pages. I encourage you to visit, like and leave a comment and as always, thanks for watching. Our story begins in Lisbon, 1481, with Christopher Columbus, the wily Italian business agent and opportunist writing to his paisano, the Florentine astronomer and mathematician Paolo del Pozzo Toscanelli, picking his brain about the proposition he made some years ago to the Portuguese king Alfonso V, about the possibility of a westward route to the Spice Islands of Maluka, an archipelago of islands in the east of modern Indonesia. Toscanelli was a high-caliber and well-connected Renaissance intellectual whose friends included the architect Filippo Brunelleschi and the philosopher Marsilio Ficino. He was part of a tight circle of academics devoted to rediscovering lost Greek and Roman scientific works, for example, coming into possession of the travelogue and maps of first-century Greek geographer Strabo.
With the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453, the long-established trade links bringing exotic goods into Europe via the Silk Road suddenly became closed and the scramble was now on to find alternative routes to the exotic textile, porcelain and spice markets of Asia. There's a common misconception that most Europeans of the time still believed the earth to be flat, but historians of science have clearly shown that there was scarcely a Christian scholar of the Middle Ages who did not acknowledge the earth's sphericity and even know its approximate circumference. They maintain that, at least since the works of Eratosthenes in 240 BC, who calculated the circumference of the earth, the rough sphericity of the earth was widely known throughout the Middle Ages of Europe. Several scholars have traced the flat earth myth to the 19th century opponents of evolutionary theory, as well as to biographers of Columbus who took substantial, shall we say, creative liberties in the telling of his story. Eventually, these myths made their way into school textbooks and generations of misinformed people just accepted it without question. Some things never change. The real issue for Renaissance scholars lay not in the belief in a spherical earth, but in its size. Several writers after Eratosthenes, such as Ptolemy, used a system of measurement known as the Arabic mile, which was about 25% longer than the Roman mile commonly used in European measurement of the time. This meant that mapmakers were grossly underestimating the width of a degree of longitude. Now, while he was in Lisbon, Columbus had married into a wealthy merchant family and had come into possession of a significant number of prized geography and travel books, along with several maps he acquired while sailing as a cargo agent for his old boss. Contemporary sources tell us that he was not a particularly gifted scholar, but his keen interest in maps and entrepreneurial streak led him to study a large number of geography, astronomy and history works, a number of which still exist, extensively covered in his handwritten margin notes and personal thoughts. He worked with his brother in a map-making shop in downtown Lisbon, where he frequently gathered even more information from sailors and merchants about their experiences at sea. We know that the map that most influenced his and Vasco da Gama's earlier voyage to India was based on a copy of 12th century Arab traveller Muhammad al-Idrisi's map drawn for the Norman king Roger II of Sicily. So, with the sudden desperation for navigating a maritime route to the Orient, Columbus poured over the available data and began obsessively calculating the distances required to get to Japan, then known as Tsipangu, which he estimated at 2,400 nautical miles, or just under 4,500 kilometres, from the Canary Islands westward. The actual distance is 10,600 nautical miles, or just under 20,000 kilometres, an enormous margin of error to be sure. Regardless, no ship in the 15th century could have carried enough food and fresh water for such a long and dangerous voyage over the treacherous Atlantic Ocean. So when he made the proposition for an expedition west to Alfonso's successor, John II of Portugal, his naval advisers balked at the idea and it was rejected out of hand. Again, not because they believed he was wrong about the project in principle, but because they correctly assessed his calculations as being only a quarter of the actual distance. They fully understood that the technology and logistics of the time made it a virtual suicide mission. The case was definitely closed with the subsequent penetration in 1488 of Bartolomeu Dias around the southern tip of Africa the first European to demonstrate that a maritime route east was possible. Columbus was laughed out of court and Portugal rubbed its hands at the prospect of a maritime trade fleet to the east, 
bypassing the Arabs. Dejected, Columbus packed up his gear and headed to Castile, which was busy mopping up the last of the Islamic strongholds in its ongoing reconquista against the Moors. Isabella I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon had just unified their realms through marriage and were keen to cement their growing power with the added cash flow that an oriental spice trade would provide them. So when Columbus showed up and floated his idea to her, she passed it on to her own advisers who, like the Portuguese scholars beforehand, dismissed it as untenable for the time being. Seeing as he had put so much ancillary work into the project, however, they retained him on their payroll, keen to prevent Columbus from giving anyone else the fruits of all his research and labour. The ambitious Italian was having none of it, however, and promptly set out for England, hoping to sell his idea there, but once again it fell flat. He was about to set off for France to see if the French might be convinced to have a go, but Isabella summoned him back to court and finally agreed to fund the voyage, because, damn it, any risk was worth outmanoeuvring their rivals the Portuguese, who had managed to wrangle control of southern Atlantic shipping routes from them in the Treaty of Alcasovas a few years earlier. This meant that the entire west coast of Africa, south of the Canaries, along with its adjacent Atlantic waters, was basically a Portuguese playground, and all Spanish ships now required a license and the payment of hefty tariffs even to sail through there. So Columbus got his ships, and in 1492 he sailed the ocean blue, and the rest is history. Which brings us to 1493. On his return voyage to Europe, Columbus first docks in Lisbon Harbour, strides into the Portuguese royal court and rubs King John's nose in it. The king spits the dummy and accuses Castile of breaching their treaty, further advising them that these newly discovered islands now belong to Portugal, given their ownership of the Atlantic. And what's more, He's about to send a huge armada to secure this new territory and sink any Spanish vessel that dares to show up. Isabella and Ferdinand had neither the navy nor the cash to engage in another protracted war with Portugal. So Ferdinand tapped his own countryman, Rodrigo Borgia, now Pope Alexander VI, to intervene on their behalf claiming that it was unfair that Portugal should get to own an entire ocean. The Pope agreed, decreeing that all lands 100 leagues west of the Azores would belong to Castile, even if it wrapped all the way around to India. Furious, the Portuguese king knew better than to challenge the Pope, but he nevertheless managed to negotiate shifting the goalposts a little further west, which would effectively give him full ownership west of a straight line that passed through the eastern hip of Brazil, in what would become known as the Treaty of Tordesillas. Anyway, this created an obvious problem when the two sides eventually met up on the far side of the world, where the Portuguese had established trading outposts on the Spice Islands that the Spanish claimed were actually in their sphere of influence. You see... The Spanish insisted that the demarcation meridian of the Treaty of Tordesillas went fully around the globe, which, according to their estimation, would situate the Spice Islands firmly in their own hemisphere. But the Portuguese were indignant, and by the time it became a serious issue in 1518, the new Pope, Leo X, a Medici power broker, and moreover, a beneficiary of the Portuguese, so decreed that the anti-meridian running through Asia would be set at 17 degrees east of the Maluka Islands. This disparity would go on to seed substantial conflict and rivalry between the two powers, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Now, before all this blew up, returning back to the post-Columbus Agreement of 1494, the two sides generally accepted the Atlantic meridian set by the Pope 
and the Portuguese themselves soon initiated an expedition led by Pedro Alvarez Cabral on a similar mission to reach India via the west in which they sailed south from Lisbon till they reached their colony on the Cape Verde Islands, then hooking around and heading directly onto the easternmost tip of the bulge of Brazil, before scouting the coast for a suitable harbour further south, where they disembarked, traded gifts with the indigenous chiefs, and then officially claimed the territory for God and King. This fortuitously accurate bumping into the easternmost promontory of South America has prompted some scholars to suggest that the Portuguese already knew about the existence of lands in the southwest Atlantic, but that they were keeping it under their hat to prevent the Spanish from getting their claws into it. In fact, there has been some suggestion that they had already established a logging industry bringing back Amazonian timber. Of course, neither the other Catholic states of Europe nor the emerging Protestant ones paid any heed to the Pope's treaty and completely ignored it, soon venturing out for themselves and establishing their own colonies, both in the New World to the West and throughout the Indo-Pacific via the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, at times coming into conflict with both Spain and Portugal, who were busy taking regular potshots at each other or otherwise conquering the various indigenous civilizations that they encountered. The reason I go into this protracted background is to demonstrate the fierce rivalry and disdain these two Iberian kingdoms had for one another, which sets the baseline for the antagonism to come in the further expansion westward beyond South America by Magellan. But we'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, as the next few years went by, both the Spanish and Portuguese got busy enslaving as many of the indigenous people as they could and plundering the adjacent countryside for gold under the forced labour system called the encomienda, whereby non-Christian communities of conquered lands were expected to provide a permanent rotating workforce that was usually exploited to complete exhaustion and death. See my video on Bartolomé de las Casas for a more in-depth discussion of this subject. One of these notorious conquistadors by the name of Vasco Núñez de Balboa heard tales of incredibly wealthy inland heathen cities, so he set out in 1513 on a military expedition using a mix of diplomacy and force of arms, making his way across modern Panama until he reached what he thought was a sea, but which was in fact the Pacific Ocean. Having divested the regional natives of their wealth and frequently also their lives and liberty, he sent reports back to Spain of this vast sea, which prompted discussions at court about the possibility of the Spice Islands being not too far offshore, such that if a way could be made through the region of modern Panama, they would have a shortcut into Asia, while at the same time avoiding the entire Portuguese hemisphere of influence. Meanwhile, Juan Fernão de Magalhães, known to us in English as Ferdinand Magellan, a brave and competent Portuguese naval officer, had just returned to Lisbon from the Far East, where he and his cousin Francisco Serrao had been involved in the conquest of Malacca by the Portuguese Viceroy of India, Afonso de Albuquerque. You see, Following the violent appearance of Vasco da Gama on the east coast of India in 1498, the Portuguese court was keen to cement its presence in the Indian Ocean in pursuit of three primary objectives. Firstly, to choke off Muslim sources of wealth and thereby cripple their power. Secondly, to spread Christianity. And thirdly, to dominate the entire spice trade back into Europe. Now, the spice trade was clearly their highest priority, as cloves, nutmeg and mace were not only used as preservatives and interesting flavours for food, but were also thought to be the only medicines that could prevent and cure the Black Death. 
or bubonic plague, that had so recently devastated the entire population of Europe. Consequently, the price of these commodities on the open market was astronomical, and if Portugal could secure a viable trade route to the source, it would become wealthy beyond imagination. So, by 1503, legendary naval commander Afonso de Albuquerque had managed to ally and assist the Hindu king of Cochin to secure his rule on the southeast coast of India against his Muslim rivals, for which the Portuguese were granted favourable trade rights and permanent outposts in these Indian lands that lay the foundation for the Portuguese maritime trading empire to come. They were soon trading enormous amounts of pepper, and activities then spread slowly south towards Sri Lanka, where they discovered the source of the cinnamon trade. By 1507, they had built a series of forts along the entire African coast, blockaded the Muslim trade routes into the Red Sea and Persian Gulf, and brought Islamic merchant shipping to its knees. Embassies were meanwhile sent further east to establish trade relations with significant potential partners such as Siam, Malacca and even China. Of these, Malacca, a natural bottleneck in the flow of goods from China, was reputedly a major regional trade hub with a diverse and cosmopolitan population comprised of local Malays, as well as immigrants and merchants from all over the Orient that traded in everything from silks and porcelain to spices and firearms. The King of Portugal was keen to curry favour with the Sultan of Malacca and made overtures of friendship and alliance if they would be allowed a trade concession in the city alongside the Chinese, Hindu and Muslim merchants that were already there. However, the embassy's initially warm welcome was soon undermined by disgruntled Muslim merchants who convinced the Sultan that the Portuguese were actually their enemy. And as a Muslim, he was duty-bound not only to reject their embassy, but to attack them. Consequently, a surprise attack on the ambassadorial fleet caused mayhem and a hasty withdrawal back to India. The diplomatic insult was avenged in 1511 when Albuquerque organised a retaliatory strike on Malacca that quickly transformed into an amphibious assault and soon after a swift conquest of the city. Favourable grants to the Hindus and Chinese merchants in its aftermath cemented their ongoing support and partnership with Portugal such that Malacca became a new base for them from which Portugal projected its power into the deeper Pacific for the next several centuries, eventually coming to control the entire trade in spices from the Maluku Islands off Sulawesi. Ferdinand Magellan, a minor noble, had entered the Portuguese king's naval service at a young age. By 25, he was in India and participating in the establishment of Portuguese outposts over the course of the next eight years, fighting in a number of significant battles, including the Battle of Dieu, in which the Portuguese fleet effectively crushed the Islamic and Allied naval presence in the Indian Ocean, opening the way for eventual European domination of the Orient. He was involved in both the failed embassy mission and the subsequent conquest of Malacca, but then returned home to Portugal in 1513, cashed up to the eyeballs from his participation in the sacking of the city, and now accompanied by a young Malay slave he purchased in its wake, in the local market. This 14-year-old Malaccan, or possibly Sumatran or even Cebuan lad, whom he baptised and named Henrique, remained by his side throughout his future voyages and would prove instrumental not only as a guide and translator, but more importantly, Henrique may actually have a legitimate claim as the first human to have circumnavigated the globe. But once again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So while Magellan was living it up back in Lisbon, his cousin Francisco Serrao, meanwhile, 
was sent beyond Malacca into the deeper Indonesian island chain to try and find the exact location of the Spice Islands. His ship was unfortunately wrecked in a freak squall, but the crew managed to get rescued and eventually found themselves at the court of a local sultan, who was keen to ally himself with a strong foreign power that might help him dominate the many other local regional chieftains. Serao was well received in the Sultanate of Ternate, becoming a close friend and advisor of the Muslim lord Bayan Sirula, who quickly married him off and set up a home for him, taking advantage of the knowledge this European might share with him. Serao never forgot his mission, however, writing to Magellan back home with information on the exact location and political situation of the Spice Islands he now called home. Now, with this new intelligence on the Spice Islands arriving from Serao, as well as the recent reports coming in of a great western sea beyond Panama by Balboa, Magellan began earnest lobbying of the Portuguese king for an expedition down the south coast of America to search for a passage around, since the dense, malaria-infested jungles of Panama would take years for the Spaniards to establish roads, and if the Portuguese could race down the Atlantic coast of South America, they might justifiably claim it under the terms of their previous Treaty of Alcasovas, which gave them claim, if you remember, to any southern Atlantic territories. It was a contentious claim, given the more recent papal pronouncement of the meridian of Tordesillas, granting everything west of it to Spain. But it was unclear whether this decree superseded the entire previous treaty or only part of it. The Portuguese certainly considered the Atlantic Ocean as their exclusive backyard, and as the old saying goes, possession is nine-tenths of the law. At least, that was Magellan's take on it. Explorers had already made it down to the Rio de la Plata, near modern-day Buenos Aires, and Magellan was confident that the elusive cape was just a little farther south, beyond the 40th parallel. If they could pull it off, Portugal would control both the eastern and western shipping lanes out of the Atlantic, and choke off Spanish pretensions to the Spice Islands for decades, and the monopoly on exotic oriental trade via both the east and west would make Portugal a superpower. In any case, by now, the Portuguese had already established quite a stranglehold on trade and shipping along the eastern route and thence throughout the Indian Ocean. So King Manuel I saw no need to waste further resources and risk unnecessary antagonism of both the Spanish and the Pope when they were already so comfortably entrenched. So he waved off Magellan's endless badgering a number of times and torpedoed any possibility of entertaining his expedition. Clearly frustrated, Magellan went on leave without formal approval, which only served to worsen his standing at court. His appointments and pay dried up, and he was left with no support and few friends who had the patience for his persistent hustling of the king in Lisbon. So he spat the dummy, renounced his Portuguese nationality, and in 1517, along with his good mate, Rui Faleiro, a cosmographer and map maker of some repute, made his way to Seville in Spain. Here, they offered their services to the Spanish king, Charles I, grandson of power couple Isabella and Ferdinand, who leapt at the opportunity to use the intelligence network and experience of one of the few Europeans who had ever been to Southeast Asia. If Magellan and Faleiro's hunch was right, the Spanish would not only save themselves unnecessary toil building roads through the muddy jungles of Panama, but also bypass all the naval checkpoints and expensive tariffs that would be levied by their rivals on the southern African route. Moreover, it would be the second time that the Spanish had benefited from a servant of the Portuguese king coming over to their side it would make their success all the sweeter. So within just 12 months, Charles had integrated the two partners into the Spanish court, 
given them titles as commanders of the Order of Santiago and raised them to the rank of captain, so they could effectively command an expeditionary voyage under the Spanish crown. In addition, Magellan and Falero would be given a financial monopoly on the discovered route for a whole decade, a guaranteed appointment as governors of any discovered territories, generous tax exemptions, and a lucrative share of the profits of any spice trade that was subsequently established. If they could pull it off, it would potentially make them rich beyond their wildest dreams. Just to give you a sense of how enthusiastic the king was for the project to go ahead, he agreed to personally fund the entire venture. But as he was already deeply in debt, he basically hocked the family jewels and took out even more loans just to make it happen. So on the 20th of September, 1519, the five-ship squadron of Carracks, christened the Armada del Maluco, set sail from San Lucar de Barameda at the mouth of the Guadalquivir River and set course for Tenerife in the Canary Islands, then the southernmost Spanish holding in the Atlantic. The five ships were the Trinidad, Magellan's flagship, the San Antonio, captained by Juan de Cartagena, the Concepcion, captained by Caspar de Quesada, the Santiago, captained by João Serrao, Magellan's other cousin and brother to Francisco Serrao, and the Victoria, captained by Luis Mendoza. On board was a crew of 270 men, comprised not only of Spaniards, but significantly 40 Portuguese, 29 Italians, 17 French, and a smattering of Flemish, Greek, Irish, English, Black Moors, and a number of Asians, including Magellan's Malaccan slave, Enrique. Faleda, who was Magellan's co-captain and designated astronomer slash cartographer, was one of the first Europeans to accurately portray the principles of latitude and longitude, and drew many of the charts to be used in the voyage. But lately, he appeared to be descending into severe bouts of schizophrenic psychosis. So at the last minute, the king disqualified him from the mission, and eventually pensioned him off for services rendered to the crown. He was replaced by a new cosmographer, San Martin, and joined by another civilian, the Venetian scholar Antonio Pigafetta, who would act as personal secretary to Magellan and whose meticulous diary gives us the most substantial surviving record of the entire voyage. All trade and financial transactions would be managed by Juan de Cartagena, skipper of the San Antonio, who stepped into Falero's vacancy as co-captain and CFO. Now, I keep mentioning the word Spain as if it were an established entity, but in reality, despite the unification by marriage of the two dominant kingdoms of Castile and Aragon in 1469, and its eventual centralization of power through the Habsburg line, the truth of it was that at the time there was still a substantial autonomy within the constituent Iberian kingdoms, such that this voyage was essentially viewed as a Castilian venture. And yet a significant number of crew in the Spanish contingent were Basque nationals, including Juan Sebastián Elcano, a talented merchant sea captain who was in a spot of legal trouble. We'll get to him later. Indeed, many Aragonese Catalonians did not speak the Castigiano dialect, making for difficulties in communication at times. In fact, some sources note that there were more Portuguese and Basques aboard proportionately than there were Castilians, despite it being nominally a Castilian project. In any event, trouble was already brewing as crew members of the varying nationalities preferred to serve together aboard the same vessel, which presented a greater potential risk of mutiny. The Spanish captains, and indeed many within the royal court, were deeply suspicious of Magellan, his being a Portuguese, and they resented his leadership of the mission, despite his obvious experience, and made no secret of their disdain for this secretive Portuguese interloper. <laughs> 
No sooner had they docked in Tenerife to top up supplies than Magellan received an urgent dispatch from his father-in-law, warning him that the Spanish captains of the other vessels were planning a mutiny, and that the King of Portugal, well informed by his own spy network, was livid with rage at what he perceived as the treasonous action of Magellan against Portuguese national interests. He had even dispatched two entire fleets of warships in pursuit of his little squadron to destroy it and arrest him. So, burdened with the threat of both internal and external enemies, he played his cards close to his chest and redistributed the crews to a more agreeable complement, as well as planting trusted Portuguese sailors among all of them. Then he resumed sailing due south along the coast of Africa, against the ardent advice of the other captains, anticipating that the Portuguese would not expect him to be stupid enough to venture into their coastal waters. The gamble paid off, and as they progressed steadily south, past the Capa Verde Islands and adjacent to the mountain known as Leone, which was part of a peninsula on the coast, and from which its Portuguese discoverer, Pedro de Sintra, in 1462, swore he could hear the mighty roar of lions. The name stuck, and today the entire country bears the name of Sierra Leone. Anyway, as they approached the equator, they experienced continuous rain for two entire months, only to emerge from the weather into a dead calm. Aimless days went by until they eventually drifted into the southwest equatorial ocean current, which carried them westwards to the Brazilian coast. The Atlantic Ocean crossing saw Magellan's small squadron endure storms lasting several weeks, and the ship's scribe, Antonio Pigafetta, relates how, during a particularly violent storm one night, they were relieved to witness St. Elmo's fire burning brightly at the top of their masts. Many times the holy body appeared to us, that is, Santelmo, and in a storm, among others, which we suspended in the darkest night, showed themselves on top of the largest cage of such splendour that it looked like a burning torch, and stayed there for more than two hours, which was so great a consort that we wept for consolation. When he wanted to leave from there, he threw so bright a splendour into our eyes that for half a quarter of an hour we remained as blind, shouting for mercy because we thought we were lost, but the sea soon became agreeable. Now, St. Elmo's fire was a phenomenon observed by sailors since ancient times and consisted of the sudden appearance during storms or unsettled weather of a bluish purple flame like glow atop masts or at the end of yard arms. The glow would disappear as mysteriously as it appeared and was interpreted by sailors as the presence of St. Elmo guarding their ship from danger during a storm. Its departure frequently associated, as in this case, with the easing of the tempest. The phenomenon is caused by the increase in atmospheric electrical activity that occurs when cloud and other gas particles become charged through the friction of atoms in the air. This friction causes the otherwise neutral gas and water atoms to become highly energised or ionised, which generates a huge voltage differential between the clouds and the ground, resulting in an electric field. When these charges become extreme, the atoms suddenly shed their outer electrons to release this excess energy in the form of lightning, which turns the surrounding air into what scientists call a plasma, as both light and extreme heat are transmitted during the discharge of the electrical energy to the ground. In a less charged area of the field, pointed objects, such as the protruding masts of ships, concentrate the energy of the field somewhat locally. A less intense discharge of light and energy occurs around these objects as the electrons of charged particles knock about, much as popular plasma balls cause discharging electrical energy 
to dance around their pole in what is technically called coronal discharge. The bluish-purple colour arises from the composition of the ionised gases while shedding their electrons, blue in the case of nitrogen and purple in the case of oxygen. It's not been observed to present any danger of fire or electrocution and Nikola Tesla demonstrated its relatively benign nature when he generated St. Elmo's fire in his experiments at Colorado in 1899, where the wings of butterflies were seen to emit a blue glow as they flittered around. Pilots today occasionally report St. Elmo's fire on their wingtips and nose cones. Charles Darwin even observed the phenomenon while at anchor in the Rio de la Plata. St. Elmo's fire derives its name from a 4th century Christian martyr, Erasmus of Formia, also known as Elmo or Telmo, who was the bishop of the Italian city of Formia in about 300 AD during the reign of Roman Emperor Diocletian, a notorious persecutor of Christians. He soon fled to the mountains of Lebanon, where he remained in solitude for seven years. Apocryphal stories tell us that he was attended and fed by a black raven. Eventually an angel appeared to him and chastised him for abandoning his duty. Returning by road, he was intercepted by soldiers at a checkpoint where he admitted his identity and whereupon he was sent to Antioch to stand trial before Diocletian. During the trial, he was severely tortured and thrown into prison, but again the angel appeared and led him to an escape. He now continued on his way through Lycia in modern Turkey, where he went on quite a baptism spree and converted many people to Christianity. At one time, he was preaching before a crowd when a lightning bolt struck the ground right next to him. Unfazed, he barely paused and carried on speaking while the crowd cowered in fear and the ground smouldered around him. It wasn't long before his proselytizing was reported to the Western Roman Emperor Maximian, who despised Christians even more than Diocletian. Once again, Bishop Elmo was arrested and led towards a pagan temple for humiliation. But the statues lining the avenue crumbled as he passed them by, and when they got to the temple entrance, it suddenly erupted into flames, preventing their entry. Furious, Maximian had him bound and sealed in a barrel that was lined by spikes, and then rolled him down a hill. But an angel instantly healed his wounds, and he emerged unscathed. This time, the emperor had him flogged, smothered in tar, and then set alight. Again, the guardian angel put out the flames, and Bishop Erasmus was starting to look like a 4th century unkillable Rasputin. Frustrated and hoping he could starve him to death, Erasmus was thrown into prison, but the angel not only fed him, but also arranged his escape once more. He was recaptured soon after because he couldn't help preaching to whomever came his way, and this time the emperor had him tied to a table and disemboweled him with an iron hook tied to a windlass, which wound up the bishop's intestines on a spool, finally ending his life in Illyria in modern-day Croatia. These apocryphal stories made him the patron saint of sailors, who were not only adept at using the windlass, but also vulnerable to flames and lightning on their tar-covered wooden ships. When the mysterious blue-purple flames would appear on their masts during a storm, they considered it a comforting omen of his presence and protection. Given the gruesome nature of his death, he is also petitioned for intercession by people with abdominal pain, cramps and women in childbirth, being considered one of the powerful 14 holy helper saints of the Catholic Church that people pray to for aid. Now, where were we? Ah yes, Magellan. Anyway, back to our story. Having survived the ravages of storm and sea in the Atlantic, the little squadron finally reached the coast of Brazil in late November and made their way down the coast to the inlet known to us today as Rio de Janeiro. 
Seeing no ships in the bay that would indicate a Portuguese presence, Magellan decided to anchor here in order to replenish supplies and repair their battered ships. Their arrival coincided with a rain shower and considering it had not rained there for some months, the local indigenous people viewed it as some kind of miracle. So the crew was treated with godlike deference and the locals adopted Christianity with enthusiasm. They spent some weeks there among the natives, trading iron tools, cloth and trinkets for food and sexual favours, with the sailors enjoying an idyllic holiday in this tropical paradise. I guess Brazilians always did know how to have a good time. The crew got on so well with the natives that when they weighed anchor two weeks later, the natives canoed beside the ships as they departed, pleading for them to stay. But it was risky to remain any longer, as the Portuguese were likely to show up at any moment. And in the meantime, Magellan had to also contend with the long-suspected mutiny by his Spanish co-captain Cartagena, who accused him of being a double agent and secretly wanting to run into the Portuguese navy. The conspirator was quickly apprehended, and Magellan was well within his rights to execute him, but in the interest of harmony, and to placate the other two Spanish captains, he merely relieved him of his command and confined him to the supervision of a more loyal crew. Leaving Brazilian waters and their dusky maidens behind, the squadron now continued south and into the massive Rio de la Plata estuary, thinking that they had found the fabled passage. But within several days of exploring the inner reaches, it became apparent that it was actually a river basin when the water slowly became less brackish. Here they encountered groups of cannibals of a tall and fearsome stature with booming voices, but it seems these locals were more afraid of the visitors than the Spanish were of them, so the natives fled inland and the crew continued their navigation without incident. Annoyed at this waste of time, they set off south once again, passing close to shore and only sailing by day to better observe the coastline for a passage. But this hugging of the coast substantially increased their risk of running aground on shoals or being blown onto rocks in a storm. Nevertheless, this closer proximity to the land gave them opportunities to observe vast colonies of penguins and seals. The crew were particularly wary of the seals, believing them to be man-eaters more dangerous than sharks and referred to them as sea wolves. The weather was now getting progressively colder, the swell more violent and storms more frequent, but more concerningly, they were now well below the 40th parallel, which Magellan had predicted would be the vicinity of the passage. The Cape of Good Hope in Africa was just under 35 degrees latitude, so confidence in the captain's calculations was eroding with every further degree south they sailed. Indeed, they would continue for a further eight weeks before fatigue and inclement weather forced the captain to scour the coast for a suitable anchorage to wait out the winter. No sooner had they found a sheltered harbour at a place they called Port St. Julian than another mutiny occurred, again instigated by Cartagena. But it seems that this time meticulous planning had gone into the rebellion. The other two Spanish captains, angered by what they saw as not only Magellan's incompetent predictions, but also his reckless sailing close to shore, again colluded in the plan, sending 30 armed sailors in a rowboat over to the San Antonio in the dead of night, which was being skippered by Magellan's cousin, if you recall. As the mutinous sailors stormed over the top, they overwhelmed the crew and its officers, killing one of them in the fracas. The next morning, another longboat was sent, full of sailors, to consolidate their control of the vessel, but the current was too strong and they drifted straight into Magellan's ship and were quickly apprehended. Eyeing the recapture of the ship from their own vessels, 
The other two captains realized they were now outgunned and outmaneuvered, so they quickly begged for clemency. This time, Magellan was in no mood for generosity, and he had the two offending lesser captains hung, drawn and quartered, hanging their various body parts off a gibbet for several months. Cartagena, having been personally installed by the king, escaped this gruesome execution, but was instead sentenced to be marooned on a nearby island, which was, barring a miracle, effectively a death by starvation. Forty additional conspirators were found guilty, including the aforementioned Elcano, and they were all sentenced to hard labour in chains for the following five months, which involved careening and repairing the hulls of ships, as well as building shelter on land. This brutal suppression had the intended effect, and life settled into a desperate and huddled boredom as the weather closed in all around them. Nevertheless, Magellan was impatient to scout the area, still convinced that the passage was just around the proverbial corner, so he sent a ship out to reconnoitre. They soon found another harbour, more sheltered and favourable than the one they were based in, with fresh water and ample food. But as they sailed back to Magellan's camp, they were hit by a freak squall, and their ship, the Santiago, was blown onto a sandbank, breaking up soon after. Fortunately, there were no casualties, and after a couple of weeks of trekking over land, they finally made it back safely to base, exhausted but alive. Despite the loss, Magellan packed up the camp and had the now reduced squadron sail to the more favourable anchorage where they remained for another six weeks, risking no more ships until the weather improved. It wasn't until October, in the springtime of the Southern Hemisphere, that the squadron finally ventured out again and in search of the elusive passage. Ironically, it was only a few days later, on the 21st of October, 1520, that they rounded a headland that Magellan named Cape Virgines, in honour of St Ursula and the 11,000 virgin martyrs, whose feast date was that day. Okay, obviously, before we go on, we need to have a quick look at who this saint was and why on earth she had 11,000 virgins with her. The name Ursula derives from the Latin word for little she-bear, and legend has it that she was the daughter of a British king called Dionotus of Dumnonia, who ruled over a territory roughly covering modern Cornwall in England. He was regent of Britain in the late 4th century, before the collapse of the Roman Empire, and the story goes that he was asked by the legendary Celtic leader Conan Meriadoc, founder of Brittany, for his daughter's hand in marriage. Now, Meriadoc was busy fighting off the hordes of rebelling Gauls, but despite his success on the battlefield, his new domain of Amorica was rather sparsely populated, so he additionally requested King Dionotus to send him several thousand eligible womenfolk who might marry his soldiers and settle into new communities there. Obligingly, the king sent his daughter who was apparently accompanied by 11,000 virgins. They travelled across the English Channel in ships, but when they got there, the Christian princess declared to her pagan groom-to-be that before she committed herself to becoming his wife, she would first need to travel to Rome on a pilgrimage. Oh, and accompanying her would be the rather large retinue of chaste handmaidens. Now, being a headstrong woman, it was clear to the befuddled groom that she wasn't asking for his permission, and legend tells us that he was so in love with her that he would have granted her every request. So, off she went, with her army of frolicking virgins, deep into insurgent enemy territory, and, as luck would have it, in the vicinity of modern Cologne, they ran into a rampaging army of Huns, who had just laid siege to the city. Being Huns, they unsurprisingly availed themselves of the princess and her unsuspecting maidens, deflowering them and then executing the entire lot of them. 
The tragic romance of the Christian princess going on a pilgrimage in order to delay her marriage to a pagan suitor, then meeting a grisly end, if you forgive the pun, is a recurring motif in Christian law, and poor Ursula was just one of several to have been martyred in this unfortunate way. Anyway, the gruesome scene was eventually discovered by other horrified Christians, and the bones of the unfortunate virgins were said to have been collected and later venerated as relics within the Basilica of St. Ursula in Cologne. Her feast day is October the 21st. So, when Magellan rounded the headland in Tierra del Fuego on her feast day in 1520, he named the cape in her honour, and incidentally, her legend is also the source of the name for the Virgin Islands, so named by Columbus when he sailed past that Caribbean paradise on the same day in 1493. Now, you might also be wondering why he named the area they were sailing through Tierra del Fuego, or the Land of Fire in English. The extreme edge of the South American continent was named Tierra del Fuego by Magellan during his famous voyage of discovery in 1520. It was so named on account of the many campfires they observed on shore while passing through the region. Right from their previous winter quarters, the expedition had come across small family groups of indigenous Yagans, who, despite the cold, were quite naked aside from the odd animal skin. These people were described as giants in stature and fearsome in appearance, with painted faces and being armed with bows, being avid seal and bird hunters. The crew had mixed interactions with these people, but they generally were open to trade, and Magellan in particular had cordial exchanges with one particular dancing fellow. Having entered the bay we now call the Straits of Magellan, a fierce storm blew up and separated the ships, with two of them being blown deeper into the waterway. When they eventually reunited, the depths were plumbed and found to be conducive to navigation, so they cautiously made their way ever deeper, with no noticeable change in the saltiness of the water. There also appeared to be tidal currents moving the other way, giving them some reason for encouragement. They eventually came to a large island, which Magellan directed two ships to explore to the left and two to the right, after which they would meet up again at the prearranged rendezvous. When Magellan's vessels returned, only one of the other ships was there to meet them. The San Antonio, the largest of the ships in the squadron by displacement and chock full of supplies, captained, if you recall, by Magellan's cousin, was suddenly subjected to another mutiny. Its Portuguese pilot, Gomez, stabbed the unfortunate captain in the debacle as he tried to set off warning cannons. The mutinous crew now abruptly turned around and headed straight back out to the Atlantic, eventually arriving back in Spain, more or less along their original route. Six months later, leaving Magellan with substantially reduced supplies. Back in Spain, the mutinous crew were of course arrested and at the subsequent trial, they related what they felt was continuous brutal treatment endured under Magellan's tyrannical leadership, describing him in the worst possible terms as a reckless and cruel captain who was prepared to endanger the king's ships and the lives of all the men under his command purely in the stubborn pursuit of his own dreams. They reported that Magellan never took the advice or counsel of his subordinate captains and treated them with such contempt that the crew fearlessly owned up to and even justified their two previously failed mutinies, despite the risk of court-martial and a death sentence. The judges swallowed the story, the mutineers were released and Magellan's reputation was significantly tarnished by their testimony. Magellan's wife, back in Seville, became a court pariah, and her husband's income was cancelled, leaving her virtually destitute and dependent on the generosity of friends. 
Meanwhile, the three remaining ships searched fruitlessly for the San Antonio for weeks, assuming they must have sunk. But while they waited for any sign of the ship, Magellan sent a scouting vessel through the northern fjord-like channels till they finally emerged into the vast ocean beyond. When Magellan heard of the breakthrough, he was said to have wept tears of joy, and upon seeing the expanse of ocean for himself a couple of days later, he named it the Pacific Sea, that is to say, ocean, because of its apparent calmness. If you think our poor old captain had it rough so far, unfortunately, it was just about to get a whole lot worse, for his crew, that is. If you recall, Magellan had grossly underestimated the distance between the southern reaches of the continent and where he assumed the Spice Islands would be by largely relying on the faulty and dubious maps produced by German merchant and cartographer Martin Beheim, who had worked closely with the Portuguese court to produce maps of West Africa. Beheim was a bit of a celebrity, it seems, with his maps and his globe, the oldest surviving one in the world, having lots of interesting, though erroneous, details, and scholars today doubt that he had visited many of the places he claimed to have charted, using his imagination to fill in the blanks. Apparently, it wasn't just Toscanelli, but also Beheim, who put the idea into Columbus's head of a westward passage to India, and it appears that once America had been discovered, he also sold Magellan on the idea that a passage through the new continent would be found, at around the latitude of modern Buenos Aires. It's just as well, because despite the strong currents and narrow fjords, the Straits of Magellan are a relatively safer option for navigation than the Drake Passage, or the Mar de Oses, so named after the two intrepid captains who took the long way round a couple of years later. Because the southern route around Cape Horn is a relatively narrow bottleneck connecting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, the currents and convergence of cold and warm water streams are so dynamic that the swell can reach in excess of 12 metres, with the weather so violent that it is considered to be the most treacherous waterway in the world, causing countless tragic sinkings and being a rite of passage, as well as a source of macho sea shanties for generations of sailors for centuries to come. Anyway, Magellan had calculated that the Spice Islands were only three or four days sailing away, but as it turned out, it would take almost four months for an expedition that barely had a couple of weeks' worth of food and water. He directed the now dwindling squadron to strike out into the vast expanse, and though they enjoyed good weather and reasonable currents, they failed to spot any islands that might be suitable to gather food and water for what would amount to thousands of kilometres of blue water. Their supply of biscuit and dry meats, typical for naval voyages, spoiled in the warmer weather, and as the weeks passed, they resorted to boiling leather and eating sawdust as starvation slowly set in. Rats, if they could catch them, were a prized delicacy, but they were soon eradicated by the ravenous crew. Scurvy also soon took a hold, with the open sores, rotting gums and delirium eventually causing the deaths of 20 or so crew members, with dozens more falling gravely ill. Of the 166 souls who emerged from the Straits, there were now barely a hundred fit enough to work. Interestingly, the senior officers didn't succumb to symptoms of scurvy, and it appears that their privileged ration of quince jam provided enough vitamin C to stave off the disease and it seems that they either didn't think to analyse why, or they kept it to themselves, not wanting to share their privileged rations with an increasingly mutiny-prone crew, who were becoming ever more disillusioned with their captain's inability to explain why they hadn't yet reached Japan, despite three months of fruitless wandering. 
some were beginning to think he was a madman. Eventually, they passed a couple of small islands that were uninhabited and offered no real sustenance besides a large presence of sharks that they spent a few days fishing for. Full bellies once again, they continued westwards without sighting any more of the many archipelagos and atolls that cluster in the vicinity until they eventually came to the Marianas, anchoring off the island of Guam. Suddenly, there were dozens of outrigger boats swarming around the three Spanish ships and Austronesian Chamorro natives swarmed on board without so much as a greeting and proceeded to make off with anything that wasn't nailed down, even managed to abscond with a bergantina or Spanish pinnace that was tied to the stern of Magellan's flagship and which was crucial for tendering and exploring. Unsurprisingly, a scuffle soon broke out and the Chamorros fled back to their village. Outraged, the captain ordered a retaliation and the crew armed themselves for a raid the next morning, burning several huts and plundering the village. In the fight that ensued, seven of the warriors were shot, but having recovered most of the stolen goods, the party returned to their ships and sailed off before the natives could organise a larger counter-attack. Astonished at the audacity of these locals, Magellan named the islands the Ladrones, which is the Spanish word for Island of Thieves. The crew now becoming increasingly ill and debilitated from starvation, they finally sighted land 10 days later, on the 16th of March, 1521. Being a Sunday and the feast day of St. Lazarus, Magellan named this archipelago in his honour. They sailed down the east coast of the island of Samar and anchored off the small uninhabited island of Homonhon, where tents were set up on shore for the comfort and convalescence of ailing sailors. Here too, native people soon appeared by canoe from the neighbouring island of Suluan, but unlike the recent experience on Guam, these people seemed friendly and hospitable. Gifts were soon exchanged and food was generously provided by the local Raja, seeing so many infirm crew members. As in Brazil, a rapport soon developed between the crew and the locals, with much conversation being had about food, customs and language of the two cultures. After ten days of rest and recovery, the ships once again set off at the instruction of the chief to head for an island called Cebu, where there was a much more powerful Raja he might make contact with. With Easter approaching, the crew laid anchor off the small island of Limasawa, where they planned to celebrate the holy day. Presently, they encountered a pair of large warships, which belonged to two Rajas from the local area, who were out on a hunting trip on the island. Magellan's slave, Enrique, suddenly realised he could understand their dialect and he now acted as a translator, with the two noblemen inviting Magellan's party to be their guests at their base camp. Now, most people associate the word Raja with India, so it might be worth taking a quick look at the cultural history of the Indo-Pacific region to get a sense of the people Magellan was coming into contact with. Magellan, just like Columbus in Hispaniola three decades earlier, was convinced that the land he encountered in the modern Philippines in 1521 was actually the fringe of India. Ironically, in a cultural sense, he may have not been too far off the mark. You see, Indian trade and colonisation of Southeast Asia had been going on since at least 300 BC, with references to Indonesian city-states in its literature, such as the Ramayana romance story, where the hero Rama sent his best general to Java in search of his lost bride Sita. Two major empires on the east coast of India, the Chola and the Kalinga, had an extensive thalassocracy, that is to say, a maritime empire built on trade that spread all the way down through Southeast Asia into the Malay Peninsula and thence through to Sumatra, Java 
and beyond. Their sophisticated culture, religion and architecture became fashionable, with the Indian language soon becoming the lingua franca among the thousands of indigenous cultures that now adopted those customs and titles for themselves. By virtue of a solid trade network that extended from India to China, in the 6th century AD, many of these Indianized chiefdoms became powerful dynasties in their own right and began projecting their own influence over less successful neighbours. So it was that by the 10th century AD, there were a number of powerful maritime kingdoms emerging out of Sumatra and Java, claiming descent from the Cholas and Kalingas of India, with tributary states of their own extending all the way north to the Philippines and east even to New Guinea. These kingdoms rose to noticeable prominence with the Srivijayas in Sumatra and the Mataram kingdom in Java. In 1292, Kublai Khan sent a force of a thousand ships from China to conquer the wealthy Singisari Empire, which was the current dynasty that ruled Java. His expedition ultimately failed, but internal feuds and competition between rival kingdoms saw continuous warfare being raged throughout the entire region, weakening their naval power. By the 14th century, Muslim traders and colonizers eventually began to settle in Sumatra and soon enough began to exert their influence in turn, supporting their own Islamized candidates for kingship and then establishing sultanates throughout the region. At the time of Magellan's arrival in 1521, much of the west of modern Indonesia had become Muslim, while the east retained a Hindu-Buddhist culture. So the Rajas that Magellan met in the Philippines were nominal vassals of the current Majapahit Empire ruling from its capital in Java, and they were busy warding off rival Muslim sultans from the west who were expanding their own territories into Borneo, as well as parts of the Spice Islands of Maluka. Over the next few years, the Majapahits would themselves be overthrown by the Muslim Demak Sultanate, and the Hindu influence that infused the Indonesian islands for over a thousand years would retreat to only a few small outposts such as Bali, which still retains a strong Hindu culture to this day. On Easter Sunday, 1521, Magellan and his company ascended a large hill where they held mass and planted a large cross, claiming these newly discovered islands, today known as the Philippines, for God and Spain. The two Rajas who hosted him were intrigued by the ceremony and took an interest in the religion of these foreigners. Many long conversations were had with Magellan and one of the Rajas even exchanging bonds of brotherhood. It seems that this inspired some kind of renewed religious zealotry in the captain, and like the previous Raja, his new blood brother recommended he travel to the much larger trading hub of Cebu, where he might find a ready supply of both converts and trade concessions, as well as a cheap source of gold. Apparently, during a conference, Magellan's other commanders counseled him to ignore Cebu and instead sail south to the Maluka Spice Islands, having now received sufficient intelligence as to their whereabouts, literally only a week's sailing away. But, as usual, Magellan took his own advice and headed for the local capital instead, where he was brought before the local warlord, Raja Humabon. This chieftain, was similarly impressed by both the Europeans' peculiar religion and a demonstration of his armour and weaponry, such that within a week of his arrival, Magellan's chaplain had not only baptised the Raja and his queen, but hundreds of locals who followed suit. The newly Christian Raja now got the idea of taking advantage of Magellan's newly awoken passion for missionary work by suggesting to him that the neighbouring island of Maktan were not only resistant to joining the true faith, they openly mocked it. Indignant, 
Magellan set fire to a number of their villages, and when its Raja, Lapu-Lapu, showed up in hostile array, Magellan, full of the Holy Spirit and keen to show off, told his host to stand by and watch as he wiped the floor with these unbelievers. Unfortunately for our captain, neither his faith nor his iron breastplate proved sufficient, as the fifty or so Spaniards that came ashore were completely overwhelmed by one and a half thousand rampaging natives in what would become known as the Battle of Mactan. Magellan's ship-borne artillery and crossbowmen were way out of range, and his armour wasn't enough to stop a poisoned arrow to the thigh. Closing in on him, he was soon cut down while holding off the enemy during a fighting retreat. In what was more like a bloodbath than a battle, the routing Europeans were speared and bludgeoned to death, and the few who escaped, including Pigafetta, barely made it back to their boats under the cover of cannon fire. Lapu-Lapu would enter indigenous folklore as a Philippine national hero for centuries to come. The remaining officers now huddled to discuss the vacant leadership, and it was agreed that Magellan's brother-in-law, Duarte Barbosa, as well as Juan Serrano, would act as co-commanders. Having his chance of conquering the neighbouring Raja, squandered by the hubris of this European braggart, must have infuriated Cebuan king Humabon, or Don Carlos as he was now called, because Lapu-Lapu now had a significant casus belli against him and would prove to be an ongoing headache. So while the new captains were licking their wounds and reviewing Magellan's last will and testament, they received an invitation to attend a banquet at the king's palace, where they could discuss what assistance they might need following the tragic loss of their leader, as well as to gift them royal jewels as a present to be given to the king of Spain. Magellan's will included a provision for the emancipation of his young slave Enrique, but the heavy dependence they placed on him as an interpreter saw the captains deny this most important of clauses, and they insisted on his remaining in servitude until a later date when his services might no longer be required. Obviously, Enrique didn't take this news of perpetual servitude well, and it seems that when he was sent back to the king to confirm their attendance at the banquet, young Enrique had a few things he needed to get off his chest. We don't know what was said, whether Enrique convinced the king that the Spanish were after his crown, or indeed whether Humabon thought he should make a goodwill gesture to his now angry neighbour Lapu-Lapu. But when 30 of the ranking officers showed up for the feast a couple of days later, following the banquet, the king called out his guards and strangled almost all of them before they could get away. Observing from the deck of their ships, and shocked at the massacre of their key officers, the crew aboard the ships decided to depart with due haste, so they weighed anchor and got out while the going was good. As they sailed away, they saw Enrique standing on shore next to the king, waving bon voyage to both the Spaniards and along with them his ongoing slavery. Many today speculate that he soon made his way back home to Malacca, never to be heard from again. If so, the honour of first human in history to circumnavigate the globe would go to an illiterate teenage Malayan slave rather than some pompous European aristocrat. History sure can have a peculiar sense of humour. Anyway, the ships now plied their way southwest, but with just over a hundred men left alive, there were not enough hands to man all three ships, so the Concepcion was set alight and scuttled, while the shaken crew made frequent stops at the many islets and villages scattered throughout the archipelago, where they usually received a warm welcome and ready assistance with supplies. 
they encountered a well-established pearling industry and plantations of cinnamon, sandalwood, nutmeg, ginger, pepper and other spices that suggested they were getting close. Italian scribe Pigafetta in his diary depicts the idyllic lifestyles of the various communities they came across, noting with interest their curious adornments and peculiar rituals such as penis piercings, a practice which had also been observed among Mesoamerican cultures thousands of kilometers away. Apparently the phrase, happy wife, happy life, applies even among native people. Some inhabitants were described as being dark as Ethiopians. Most were virtually naked, but occasionally they came across chiefs who were resplendent in silken robes and gold jewelry from their trade with China. The ships also began to encounter occasional Muslim communities the further south they went, where they nevertheless also usually received a warm welcome. Our Italian scribe was particularly fascinated by the widespread practice of chewing betel leaf, a peculiar and addictive custom that still persists there to this day. To their discredit, the crew occasionally engaged in acts of piracy against merchant vessels, which brought them into conflict with the Sultan of Brunei. But in a notable engagement, the Spaniards defeated this naval force and even captured their commanding prince, negotiating a substantial ransom for his release some weeks later. During their time plying the waters of the Philippine archipelago, the crew of the Victoria and Trinidad, grieving at the loss of their captain, Magellan, and the betrayal of Raja Humabon, who murdered 27 of their officers, placed the last remaining Portuguese captain, Carvalho, at the head of their now dwindling squadron, which was now reduced from five to two ships. But his selfishness began to undermine his qualities. The crew became increasingly dissatisfied and they removed him from command under questionable circumstances replacing him with Juan Sebastián Elcano, who, till now, had remained in the shadows for pretty much the entire voyage. I've already mentioned Elcano early on as being a competent and experienced merchant navy captain who had got into some legal trouble over an unauthorized sale of one of his ships a few years ago back in Spain. You see, during a conflict, all ships were viewed as potential military vessels and could not be sold without appropriate government approval. But Elcano, at the time, was in debt to some Savoyard financiers and was obliged to hand over his ship as collateral to them. Fortunately, the court case was still going on back in Castile when he signed up for this voyage, hoping to receive a royal pardon and avoid prison through his participation in the venture. But being a Spaniard, and expressing a personal dislike of Magellan, he felt compelled to support his countrymen when they mutinied on both prior occasions back in the Atlantic, and then spending several months in chains after the St. Julian mutiny. One of the reasons given for the continuous uprisings against Magellan was the complete secrecy with which he commanded the voyage. He typically refused to divulge his daily plans, and the source of his predictions, which led many of the officers to believe he was just making things up as he went along. His paranoia, rashness and harsh demands on the crew only distanced them from him further at the very times that they needed a charismatic and inspiring leader to get them through. It seems that Elcano, or as he himself spelled his name, Delcano, was one of those unassuming but experienced sailors who knew much but spoke little. His quiet competence eventually became prominent, but not before pretty much every other ranking officer had died. Nevertheless, he and Gomez de Spinoza, now sharing command of the Victoria and Trinidad respectively, eventually island-hopped their way to the mother load of clove production the Sultanate of Tidor, in November of 1521, where they were warmly greeted by Sultan al-Mansur, 
who readily offered them a trade agreement and alliance with Spain. You see, Al-Mansur was under some expansionist pressure from a rival warlord across the pond in the Ternate Sultanate on Sulawesi. It was there that the Portuguese agent and cousin of Magellan, Serrao, had long made his home some years ago and from whom Magellan learned of the location of the Spice Islands. It turned out that Francisco Serrao had died at roughly the same time as Magellan so the two old friends never managed to actually meet up, though they were so close and only a week's sailing distance away from one another. Had Magellan decided to stick to his mission, rather than meddle in Cebu politics, the two would have embraced in a historic occasion of East-West conjunction, about which songs and paintings would no doubt have been long celebrated. But it was not to be, and fortunately for the Spaniards, the Tidor Sultan was more than happy to ally himself with Spain to offset the alliance that Ternate had with Portugal. It wasn't long before a Portuguese agent found out about their arrival and made his way over to parley with the Spanish. Apparently, the Sultan over in Ternate was also unhappy about his alliance with the Portuguese and was seriously considering switching sides himself. There was a rumour that he had fallen out with Serrao and actually had him poisoned, so this new agent was feeling rather nervous that he might be next. However, they were also informed that the Portuguese Viceroy of the region had received intelligence of the Spanish mission and was instructed to hunt them down and destroy them. The race was now on to get out of town before the big boys arrived and they hastily packed their ships to near bursting with all the cloves they could stuff into their holds. The two captains now discussed their options. Gomez de Espinosa wanted to return to Spain via the Pacific route they had just come from, claiming that those were the orders they were actually given at the outset of the voyage while Elcano proposed heading southwest instead, deep into the Indian Ocean toward Africa, keeping well away from Portuguese patrolled sea lanes. Both options entailed sailing long stretches of open ocean with little opportunity for resupply, but as they couldn't agree, they decided to part company and take their chances each to his own. Moreover, a dozen or so men disliked either option and chose to remain in paradise, risking Portuguese prison rather than starving to death on the deep blue. Forty-seven men chose to sail with Elcano on the Victoria, including a dozen or so Malayans who the Sultan pressed into their service. So, in December of 1521, as the lumbering ships prepared to depart, their holds, pregnant with tons of cloves, the Trinidad began taking on water and was forced to retire to the dock to repair the damage. The Victoria, the second smallest ship of the original squadron, carried her weight well and now made her way gradually southward toward Timor, island hopping as they did before and being met by generous and friendly locals along the way. These often told stories of mythical beasts, enchanted forests, pygmy-like tribesmen who lived underground, of cannibals and even an island of Amazons that kill any man who comes near. Like the Argonauts of ancient Greece, they meandered their way through this tropical labyrinth of timeless secrets until they eventually struck out into the Indian Ocean and headed southwest well away from the Sumatran and Indian coastlines, and in fact, passing only within several hundred kilometres of Australian shores, where they might have stopped for rest and supplies, had they been just a little closer. But they pushed on ever southward, and reaching the 42nd parallel, the freezing crew maintained the latitude, but ran into westerly breezes that required some skill to navigate against. They spent nearly three months battling the raging sea, the cold and the weather, as supplies dwindled and all there was left to eat 
rations of rice boiled in seawater. Unsurprisingly, scurvy once again ravaged the crew and several sailors begged Elcano to call into Mozambique on the African coast, even if it meant imprisonment and torture by the Portuguese authorities. A more democratic leader than his unfortunate predecessors, the captain put it to a vote, and the crew decided in favour of keeping their honour and pushing on to complete the mission. But as they approached the Cape of Good Hope, impossible headwinds held them up for weeks and forced the decision to head close to shore, risking either being wrecked on the dangerous reefs along the coast or capture by the Portuguese. By some miracle, they eluded both, but as they rounded the Cape, the situation was becoming more dire by the day. The hull was starting to rot and leak from worm infestation, and men were dying like flies from starvation, so they searched fruitlessly for a landing along the coast of Guinea and Senegal, but to no avail. This time, another vote was had to call into the Cape Verde Islands, and fake their identity as having blown in from America. 21 men were now dead, including seven Malayans, agonizing sacrifices that could no longer be justified. So they called into port and sent out a party of men to procure supplies, as well as African slaves to man the bilge pumps, using what little barter they had left, while concealing their precious cargo of cloves, which would instantly betray their true identity and land them in prison for a very long time. They bluffed their way into the purchase of a couple of bushels of rice, but the authorities were tipped off about their cargo and scrambled to impound the vessel. Elcano called to shove off, leaving 13 sailors stranded on the dock who were soon rounded up by the governor and imprisoned. Having escaped the clutches of the Portuguese authorities on the Capa Verde Islands, the 18 surviving men left aboard the Victoria now set course for home. But it wasn't a case of their making a simple beeline up the coast of Africa. You see, the various wind patterns that exist because of the Coriolis effect create a consistent gyre of air currents that circulate clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and counterclockwise in the southern. This means that the prevailing winds at the location of the islands, at roughly 15 degrees north of the equator, would be blowing head-on and out to the west. Portuguese navigators had long learned that it was actually more efficient, if counterintuitive, to sail out to sea perpendicular to the winds we now call the northeasterly trades and then ride the clockwise turn of the winds as they become the southwesterlies that would now be at their backs as they approach the Iberian coast. This turn of the breeze was known as the Volta do Mar, and it enabled Europeans to strike out with confidence across vast expanses of ocean and predict the likely wind direction based solely on their latitude. So it was that the Victoria had one last broad loop to sail before finally making its way through San Lucar de Barameda and up the Guadalquivir River, docking at Seville. But not before the exhausted and emaciated survivors managed to fire off a cannon salvo to salute their monarch and celebrate their return. Meanwhile, the poor old Trinidad, back in Tidor, took months to repair and sailed off north in search of favourable westerly winds that might take them back to the American coast, before the Pacific finally showed its true capacity for violence and they were hounded by a relentless storm for weeks that forced them to head back to safety. They returned only to find the Portuguese had occupied their former holdings and two-thirds of the fifty or so sailors left behind were dead. Themselves emaciated and ravished by scurvy in their failed adventure northwards, Espinosa surrendered to the occupiers, with the ship, its maps, goods and cargo seized, and the crew jailed indefinitely. Their hapless Portuguese agent was taken outside and summarily executed for treason, 
only four of the 50 or so men of the Trinidad made it back to Spain alive. While the Trinidad was awaiting its fate, Elcano, back in Seville, was busy writing a short letter to King Charles, briefly outlining their journey, their suffering and sacrifices, the lamentable death of their leader while spreading the Christian faith, and the capture of their comrades whom he implored the king to rescue from the Portuguese. He gave an account of their successful diplomatic mission to the peoples of Maluku and their readiness to trade under Spanish protection. Nowhere in his account did Elcano mention himself or brag about the staggering voyage he commanded to successfully return home, albeit battered and shattered. He did, however, manage to negotiate a pension and honours for himself, though he never quite made it into the inner circle at court. With the eventual release of the prisoners in Capa Verde and the arrival of those last four members of the Trinidad, only 35 of the original 270 crew members made it back to Spain alive, along with four Moluccans who were keen to meet the king. A subsequent mission to capitalize on their newfound trade route, known as the Loaisa expedition, in which Elcano once again volunteered to participate, ended in complete disaster, with Elcano dying at sea from scurvy, and the entire fleet, this time comprised of seven ships, was either scattered, wrecked, or abandoned the mission, with only one small ship making it to their destination the 25 sailors left on board barely making it there alive. No sooner had they arrived than they were arrested by a Portuguese patrol, and eventually they were returned home in now the second circumnavigation of the globe, with one of the crew, Hans von Aachen, having been aboard Magellan's voyage, now being the first man to circumnavigate the globe twice. It should be said that the cargo of cloves brought back by the Victoria, when all costs were accounted for, astonishingly turned a significant profit, given the extraordinary price of spice on the open European market, such that, in cash terms, the venture was actually a complete success, and the surviving sailors became rich enough through their share of the profits to retire. Of course, the loss of almost 90% of the crew through the horrors of starvation, disease and battle is hardly an achievement worth celebrating, but such a casualty rate was typical of the golden age of sail until the 1770s when Englishman James Cook proved that dietary supplementation of fresh fruit, vegetables, malt and sauerkraut could reduce the death rate to virtually zero. So, what can we say about the legacy of Magellan and the circumnavigation of the globe by his intrepid and heroic crew? Interestingly, Elcano, being a mere commoner as well as a Basque national, was given a cold shoulder by the Castilian court as such an incredible enterprise as proving the sphericity and dimensions of the globe through circumnavigation were considered honours fit only for a gentleman and the distaste of lauding a peasant shifted public focus instead onto Magellan, such that Elcano's role was initially marginalised. Nevertheless, Magellan's image too continued to suffer from the ongoing inquest into his harsh conduct that tarnished his reputation in the eyes of the Crown and ordinary Spaniards. It didn't help that he was himself Portuguese rather than Spanish, for which his original homeland condemned him as a traitor of the highest order. Indeed, the rivalry between the two Iberian powers now accelerated in earnest with continual skirmishing for control of lucrative outposts throughout Southeast Asia, escalating the already volatile atmosphere in which Muslim sultans were seriously displacing the indigenous culture and long presiding Hindu states in the region of the South Pacific. The Pope would eventually settle the anti-Meridian right of possession question 
first brought on by the Treaty of Tordesillas, by giving the Spice Islands in their entirety to Portugal and the Philippine archipelago to Spain, from which new treasure fleets would eventually make their way to Acapulco, then overland via Mexico City to Vera Cruz, a safer and eventually more efficient route than the southwest passage of Magellan. Spain's ravenous conquest of the New World and its exploitation of indigenous people would cause a genocide from which they have yet to recover, and perhaps never will. Pigafetta, the Italian scribe who gave us the most comprehensive narrative of the voyage, would go on to publish his precious journal in several languages, travelling through Europe and becoming quite the celebrity, before returning home to Florence to a life of relative obscurity. The painstaking daily measurements taken during the voyage did not omit even a single entry in the ship's log. But Pigafetta and Elcano were surprised to see that the date of their arrival on the Capa Verde Islands seemed to be a day later than the local calendar suggested. The Arab geographer Abul Feda predicted that circumnavigators travelling westwards in what is known as the circumnavigators paradox would accumulate a one-day offset to the local date, effectively one hour forward for every 15 degrees traversed, while those travelling eastwards would lose one day relative to their starting point, a concept explored in Jules Verne's entertaining novel Around the World in 80 Days. Today, international treaties have set an international dateline and boundaries to better demarcate one calendar day from the next. The explosion of the spice trade saw the emergence of a completely new social and economic order in Europe, with ever greater emphasis on venture capitalism, mercantile trade and academies of science, as the world now became ever smaller and well-connected. This mercantilism financed the expansion of Protestant individualism and a gradual diminishing of church power as intellectuals began promoting the merits of humanism and the separation of church and state. It also saw the permanent collapse of Islamic control of oriental trade routes, both of the ancient Silk Road and the maritime Indian Ocean networks that produced incredible wealth and financed their wars against Christian Europe. By the 1700s, the Islamic world would be a mere shadow of its former glory, as Portuguese, Spanish and increasingly the Dutch and English trading companies rivaled entire nations in their economic and political influence. It was in every sense the rise of the oligarchs and plutocrats as the real power brokers in world affairs that would set in motion a trend that continues in one form or another to this very day.